Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're both challenged and encouraged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. And I will use you as a focal point So I don't lose sight of what I want Take your Bibles out, turn to Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, and let us stand together for the reading of God's Word today. Surely He took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. The King James Version says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And I'll begin with verse number 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down. Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and he sweat like it were as drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he went back to the disciples. He found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so you will not fall into temptation. Let us pray. Father, we love you so much. We are thankful, God, today that we can come to you. We are thankful, Lord, that you took our stripes upon your back. You took our place on the cross. You bled and died so we would not have to. And we thank you, God, for your sacrifice. We thank you, God, that when you got to the garden, Lord, you said, not my will, but yours be done. So I'm so thankful, God, you did that for us. Open up your word. Open up your scripture today that we might understand the power of your blood. And we love you, God. We ask it in your mighty name. Amen. And amen. Turn to someone, tell them they could use, you could use that extra hour of sleep. You're looking kind of rough this morning. And then you may be seated. I'm looking around. I think several people miss daylight saving time. They're on their way here right now trying to make that 9 o'clock service. So when they come in and sit down, clap for them real loud. Give it up. No, don't do that. Let's, let's not make them feel bad. We're in beginning a new series entitled Wounded, and what we're going to do over these next five weeks is we're going to look at the different times Christ spilled blood. Every drop of blood that fell was for us, and so we'll be looking at that together and growing together, and we see it, and our, our theme text for the entire series will be Isaiah chapter 53. It says he was wounded for our transgressions, our suffering Messiah took our place. He predicted a time when a person would come and he would lay down his life for us and he would die for us. And so he bore his wounds that we might have life. Now what happens is we get really excited about Easter. And I'm excited about Easter and I love Easter and I love the resurrection. But we can't fail to remember that it was preceded by the crucifixion. And the crucifixion was bloody. It was an act bathed in blood. It was a, absolutely a bloody mess. And it's easy to miss the full power of Easter by focusing only on the beauty of the resurrection and overlooking the brutality of the cross. Jesus wanted us to remember his blood. 
when he was with the disciples and they took communion, took that last supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. I will tell you, I want you to come every single Sunday over these next four weeks because every week we're going to take communion. We're going to remember his blood. We're going to remember his blood. And so at the, at, at, during the service, at some point in that service, we're going to take communion together as a body of Christ. Amen? Many Christians don't like to focus on the blood. They don't like to talk about it. It makes them uncomfortable. They want to say Christianity is a bloody religion. But I want to tell you, biblical ignorance, especially in the area of the blood, can be detrimental to your spiritual life. If you do not understand the power of the blood and the impact of the blood and the import of the blood, it will leave you open to satanic attack. The blood is our defense line against the attack of the enemy. Take away the emphasis on Jesus' blood and you have no basis of relationship that we can have with God and you have no means of resisting Satan. And so the blood is absolutely critical to everything we do in our faith. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the first time that Jesus Christ spilled his blood was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is an occasion when no one took it from him. He just began to pray and cry out to God and his capillaries opened up and he began to sweat, the Bible says, as it were, drops of blood. And so we're going to look at Gethsemane today. The word Gethsemane means oil press. And, and it's, an, it's an olive grove. It's a vineyard. I, I had the privilege of going over. In fact, it doesn't say Gethsemane in Luke's gospel. It will say it in Matthew and again in Mark. And we had the privilege of going to the Holy Land. I've been there a couple occasions. And one of the stops you will make as you go to the Holy Land is the Garden of Gethsemane. And we went on that hillside on the Mount of Olives. And there are olive trees all over that. And it's a very moving place. It, it, it was just a time of remembering what Christ did for us and And so we gathered there on that hillside, and there were olive trees that are there today that they say date back all the way to the time of Jesus Christ. So it's pretty phenomenal. The trees that he was in the middle of, I was able to see those trees themselves. And they would pick the olives there, and and what they would do is they would take the olives to the olive press, and they would begin to crush those olives until all the juice would come out. And so it was in Gethsemane that Jesus Christ was being crushed And he would be crushed for us on Calvary. And so you have the whole imagery of him being crushed that we might have life again. And so he goes into this garden of Gethsemane and he's going to taste judgment that we should all have for ourselves. Now there's some interesting contrast between another garden. There's the garden of Gethsemane. There's a garden all the way back at the beginning of time called the Garden of Eden. Let me just draw a few of these contrasts with you if I may today. At the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned. At the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ suffered. The Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve parlayed with Satan and he came in in the form of a serpent. At the Garden of Gethsemane, the last Adam, Jesus Christ beheld the face of his Father. At the Garden of Eden, humanity was lost. At the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, I have lost none of those that you have given me. At the Garden of Eden, Adam took the fruit from Eve's hand. At the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ takes the cup from his Father's hand. the Garden of Eden, Adam is driven out of the garden. At the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ would be led away like a lamb being led to the slaughter. The Garden of Eden resulted in death. The Garden of Gethsemane would ultimately result in everlasting life. The Garden of Eden was a place of disobedience and sin. The Garden of Gethsemane was a place of obedience and surrender. Isn't that awesome? In other words, Jesus Christ came to undo what happened through the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now I think one of the most interesting contrasts, and this is where we're going to draw our thought from today, in the Garden of Eden, after the fall, the ground was cursed And man from from then on would have to work, the Bible says, with the sweat of his brow. The ground rebels against humanity. It would grow thorns and thistles. Uh, And so God told them that from this time on, you will work your ground by the sweat of your brow. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Word of God says, Jesus Christ sweat, as it were, drops of blood, and the text says, falling to the ground. 
the curse happens in the Garden of Eden, Jesus Christ is going to sweat drops of blood for us to undo the curse, to reverse the curse once and for all. It goes all the way back to the Garden. He would have to do that through his own blood. You see, before the fall, Adam kind of was in a managerial position over the garden. And everything was great in the garden. And he had it made in the garden. And God provided everything for him uh, that he would ever need. And the ground cooperated with Adam. And it was a very fruitful garden. It was a very fruitful place. The animal creation cooperated with Adam. And he would name all the animals. And so they are all in obedience. They are all working in harmony perfectly in the garden. Man would take from God's creation... He would provide himself from all that God had to give him, uh, and he would live for the glory of God. And you have a situation in the Garden of Eden before the fall that it was a place of rest, and it was a place of perfect peace in God. But in the fall, man declares himself independent of God. Adam says, God, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. I can eat from any tree I want to. I can do what I want to. I don't need you anymore, God. I will choose to live out of my own resources. I will choose to go my own way. And it's in that time that the whole garden begins to turn against Adam and all of creation begins to turn against him. And even today, the Bible says the whole earth groans waiting for its redemption to come. And man has a signature for his restlessness, and that's sweat. The Bible tells us that Adam, he said, the ground will be cursed. It will grow up thistles and thorns, and from now on you will work the land from the sweat of your brow. And so that kind of becomes a symbol of his lack of peace or his restlessness. Isaiah 57, 20 and 21, the wicked are like the tossing of the sea, which cannot rest whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And so man would begin his restless search for meaning and his restless search for joy and life, uh, and he sweats trying to be good, uh, and he sweats trying to earn his salvation, and he sweats somehow trying to please God in some way. And the temptation is the same today as it was in Adam's day. He says, in the day you eat of this fruit, the Satan said, you shall be as gods. Uh, And so man is always trying to be his own God unto himself. Uh, But the Bible says he will always fall short of the glory of God. There is no way any one of us in our own sweat, in our own mind, in our own energy uh, can ever live up to the glory of God. And so man is cast out of the garden and he leaves the garden of Eden rest. Now I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and look if you would at verse number 9. And I preached a little bit on this. We touched on this when we talked about the feast, and we talked about the Sabbath rest. But as we talk about the peace that comes through the blood, you've got to go back to Hebrews chapter 4 again. Hebrews 4 and verse number 9. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest. Rest, everybody say rest, rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following the example of disobedience. There yet remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Listen, he is our Sabbath rest. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. Only peace can be found in him. In other words, we rest from all of our own works. I, I, I rest from having to prove myself uh, from my struggle against sin. Uh, why? Because Jesus Christ has finished the work on the cross. Uh, his death and resurrection was enough. And so now through Christ Jesus, I can enter into that perfect place of rest and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's done it all on the cross. Mankind is born into a restless, sweating world. 
and he feels guilty like I, I got to do more work for God, but it is never, ever good enough. But when I enter into what Jesus Christ has done, I enter into his grace. It's God in me. It's his life living through me. And so I don't have to work and strain and stress anymore. It is Christ in me, the hope of glory. And so I enter into that rest. And so Jesus Christ sweat drops of blood so I wouldn't have to sweat it. Isn't that good? He sweat drops of blood so I would never have to sweat it. And I read Isaiah at the beginning, Isaiah 53. Look at verse number 5 again. It says, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The first thing we're going to look at in this series is the peace that we can have through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, in verse number 11. Great, great passage right here. I want you to listen to this. Ephesians 2 and verse number 11. Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision, by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, Remember that at, this, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the first thing he tells the Ephesians is, I want you to remember the wall. Remember the wall. And he says, remember how that formerly you were far off. Remember how formerly there was a wall there. Remember how formerly you were called the uncircumcision by those who were circumcised. You were put down. You were criticized. You were not a part of the household of Israel. Remember all those things. But I want you to also remember now the wall is gone. It has been torn down once and for all. Paul's talking to Gentiles. When he says in verse number 11, he says, you were called the uncircumcision by those who are circumcised. There was all kinds of racial tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. Every bit as strong as there was between blacks and whites in the 1940s and 50s and the race riots and all that that was going on. That was the same kind of tension that existed between those who were Jews and those who were not. And so to call somebody uncircumcised was to call them a heathen dog. And this whole prejudicial thing is going on. And they had a temple in Jerusalem, and they had the temple, and they had the court of the Gentiles, which was the farthest away from the Holy of Holies, uh, and they had a wall that divided the court of the Gentiles uh, from the Jews. And on that wall, there was written in both Latin and Greek, anyone who goes beyond this wall will suffer death. And so that wall had always separated them from the rest of the Jews and in some respects was a symbol of their separation from God and their uncircumcision. But now Paul is writing to a, a Gentile church in the city of Ephesus. Uh, some Jews were there, but many of those in Ephesus were now Gentiles and now they are a part of the family of God. They are a part of the church. And he says, I want you to remember, not only were you separated from your fellow Jews, uh, but more importantly, uh, worse than that, you were separated from God, and you had no hope, uh, and you were away from him, uh, and you were living, as it were, the very definition of spiritual death. And you were foreigners and strangers to the covenants of God. And he says, you were without hope because you were without God. And there was that bitter wall of separation uh, that separated from them, them from God, symbolized by that wall that was in the temple area. They were always outside of the family of God. There was no hope. There was no peace. Uh, there was no rest. That wall separated them. He says, I want you to remember where you once were. Remember the wall. In 1949, following the defeat of Nazi, Germ Nazi Germany in World War II, the Germans, the Soviets came in from the east, the 
Americans came in from the West, and so they had their treaties. At the end of the treaty, they said, you know what, we're going to separate Germany right down the middle, and it's going to go right through the city of Berlin, and the western side will be, the eastern side will be operated by communist, German, communist government, will set up by the Soviet Union and run East Germany. The West would be a free demo- democratic government, and you know anytime there's a democracy and freedom, the economy benefits. Everything's big and socialism doesn't work, communism doesn't work as an economic system. And so the Western Berlin was thriving, it was growing, the economy was awesome, the Eastern uh, Germans were in absolute poverty under the communist regime. And so, uh, fearful of losing their citizenship, East Germany begin to, they begin to cross the border and they begin to flock over to West Germany. And so finally, in 1952, they close the borders and they say, from this time on, no more East Germans will be allowed to go into Western Germany. But that didn't stop them. Over the next several years, an estimated 2.5 million East Germans uh, fled to West Germany between 1949 and 1961. And so they said, everybody is going to West Germany because the economy is great. There is freedom in their land. Uh, it's not communism. We, they wanted to get out of there. And so in 1961, they built a wall. And they built a wall that went all the way down through Berlin and separated West Germany from East Germany. And thus began the Cold War. You know the symbolism of that wall that was there. And that wall stood for almost 30 years as a symbol of the great divide between the East and between the West uh, and the Cold War and all that represented. And then in 1987, President Reagan makes his famous speech. He is standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate on the West Berlin side of Germany. Take a look. It may bring back some remembrance for you guys. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. separated East Germany from West Germany had stood for 30 years. And President Reagan makes that famous speech, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I want to tell you, when Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross and when he died for us, he tore down that wall. The Bible says in Ephesians, he tore down the middle wall of partition. Uh, That wall that separated us as a body between Jew and Gentile, he says that wall has been torn down. Uh, It has come down. Uh, Families that have been held apart by a wall, some of their family living on one side of East Germany, the others on west side, Uh, they could never be together again. Uh, That wall came down and so it is in the family of God. God. Now we all come to the Lord Jesus Christ through the very same blood of the Lamb of what Jesus Christ has done for us, uh, and that wall has come down. Fam- and, and when people go to Berlin today, 
The most frequently asked question that travelers have when they go to Berlin is they say, where's the wall? Where's the wall? I want to tell you, it's not there anymore. The wall has come down, and so it is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul starts out this treatise on peace and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he starts out by saying, remember the wall. Remember that you were strangers. Remember that you were foreigners. Remember that you were separated from God. That you were not a part of the household of God. Remember all those things. But then he goes to verse number 14. He says, but Christ is our peace. Hallelujah. Let's pick it up with there. Pick it up with verse 14. For he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. And in his one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Christ is our peace. He bled for us, he died for us, uh, that we might have peace today. He's torn down the wall. Jesus Christ is our peace. Now, a lot of times we think of the word peace to mean the absence of war. And obviously there's a shade of meaning there. We're no longer, you know, you think you're not fighting Iraq anymore, Afghanistan anymore, and so somehow we are at peace. But the word peace, the biblical word peace, does not simply mean the absence of hostility. It means much more than that. There is a Jewish word, shalom. Everybody say shalom. Turn to your neighbor and say shalom. It is a comprehensive term. It's a comprehensive term for salvation. It's a comprehensive term for the life of God. It means wholeness, completeness, well-being, and prosperity. So when you said shalom to someone else, you are wishing them well. You are wishing them wholeness and completeness and well-being and prosperity. Shalom is the way things ought to be. It's the way things were in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve sinned. It was a place of wholeness and well-being and prosperity and wellness. Shalom. Christ has come back to restore our peace, to tear down the wall, to bring us to God. Christ has restored the ideal, the shalom, our peace, by destroying the wall. When he destroyed the wall, now he brings Jew and Gentile together, and they are one new man reconciled to God. And he goes on to say in Ephesians, we now have full access to God. We were walled away from God previously because of our sins. Our sins were always a wall that separated us from a holy God. But through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the wall has come down uh, and now have access myself into the presence of the living God. All the barriers are are gone. Jew and Gentile, white and black, male and female, now have full access to the Father because we all share, the Bible says, in one spirit. Hallelujah. Christ is our peace. He shed his blood to make access to the Father so I can have peace with God. Incredible. Hallelujah. How is that peace appropriated? We read it here. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. It is very, very clear there. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse number 19. Our peace is appropriated through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Colossians just says it right out. This is how it came. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all to himself all things, whether things on the earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
It is the act of his sacrifice. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that bridges the gap that separates human beings from God Almighty. He makes peace. He reconciles us back to God through his blood. He provides lasting reconciliation and friendship with him. In fact, the blood, the forgiveness that comes through the blood is so complete that in God's eyes, every sin you've ever done is like it's never happened. It's gone. It disappears. It vanishes. So all that sin that separates us from a holy God is now gone and finished forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us, our transgressions from us. Jesus' blood accomplished a permanent blow to sin, and it's by his blood that we're forgiven. And by his blood, peace is made with God. Now, how do I know this for myself? I can't come into the peace of God. I can't be reconciled to God until I ask his blood to be applied to my life personally. And it's at that point I say, God, I need you. I can't save myself. I am restless. I can't earn my own salvation. I can only have peace through the sacrifice you made for me. And that begins when I submit to God and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made our peace through the blood. Remember the wall? Remember where you came from? Jesus Christ is our peace. How is that peace provided? Through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to turn back, if you will, very quickly to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 40, 42. Verse 42, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now what is this cup? Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Let it be taken away from me. The cup represents the anguish and punishment and judgment that Jesus Christ is about to face when he would go to Calvary. It was the dread of being made our sin offering, becoming that perfect Lamb of God, it was the chill of being forsaken and separated from the Heavenly Father because you know when he hang on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so when he took all our sins uh, upon himself and, and he, knew, who, he who knew no sin became sin for us, and it brought that separation from his Heavenly Father. The serpent, the devil, was about to bruise his heel the Roman Gentiles would mock him and they would scourge him. The Jews would cry out, crucify him. But they didn't mix the cup of suffering. They didn't mix the pain together. The cup was mixed by his heavenly father. All those that were surrounding characters, the supporting cast, they're not the ones who crucified Jesus Christ. That cup was mixed by God himself. Jesus accepted the Father's cup because it was mixed by the Father and it was given by his own hand. You say, where do you get that? Listen to Isaiah 53 and verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It was God's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Verse number six, the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The cup was handed to him from the Father himself, and that's why he cries out, God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Now listen to me today. When you go through suffering in your own life, when you go through pain in your own life, you never need to fear the Father's cup that he hands us. 
Two reasons. Why? Because our Savior has already drunk from the cup for us. The second reason is the Father always prepares the cup in love. And there are times in our life when we may suffer pain and we may suffer a heartache in this world in which we live today, but eventually the suffering is always transformed into glory. Just as it was for Jesus Christ when he went through his suffering and his anguish, it ultimately resulted in his glory. It says he suffered for us looking forward to the glory that lied ahead of him. And when we see God's hands in all things, uh, when we understand Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good uh, to those who love the Lord, uh, even in pain, uh, even in suffering, uh, we know that God still loves us. Uh, God is still good uh, and God will ultimately bring us through. Uh, And when we understand that, then we can have that perfect peace that passes all understanding. Uh, And when we go through trials and tests, uh, the world can't figure out. Uh, They don't know why we still have joy. Uh, They don't know why we have a calmness in our heart. Uh, But we've come to understand uh, that the cup has been handed to us by our loving uh, Heavenly Father who loves us and cares about us and died for us and took my place. That's why I can have peace in the middle of a storm. Christ is my peace, and he never changes. Believers who struggle with peace fail to comprehend the value and power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. I know that today, in this house today, some of you love Jesus, you love Jesus Christ, You, you love him with all your heart, But for some reason, you're still restless. For some reason, you're still filled with worry. You still have anxiety. You still get stressed out. You still need a pill to help you to sleep at night. You're still going through challenging, difficult times. But when you begin to understand the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the peace we have from him and the fact that he's already drunk it for us, it will bring peace. The blood is the key to our peace. Not only our reconciliation with God himself, peace with God, but he is also, it is also through the blood that he gives us in our own hearts the peace of God that passes all understanding. And that peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's like a homeless man. He's been homeless. He's starving to death. He's been eating out of dumpsters. And he has a rich family member that dies. And that rich family member left the last will and testament. uh, And he left his inheritance to this homeless man who's eating out of the dumpsters. Uh, And in his last will and testament, he says, from now on, uh, you will be a wealthy man. Uh, You will have land. Uh, You will have money. You will have authority. You will have servants. Uh, You will never go hungry again. But if he doesn't understand the document, if he doesn't understand the last will and testament, His inheritance will lay unclaimed for the rest of his life and he will die in poverty. Listen to me. If you fail to comprehend the significance and power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not have that peace that passes all understanding and you will live and die beyond the inheritance we have in Christ Jesus. We struggle through this life and we feel ashamed for my sins and ashamed for my guilt and we worry about our past and we have these uncertainties, does God really love me or not? And we're thinking we have to earn God's favor and we have to work to make peace with God and and God, somehow i got to work my way into your presence and we live beneath our inheritance as children of God. The blood of Jesus Christ, he is our peace and he's made peace through us through his blood. And if today you'll get this message into your heart and spirit, hallelujah, hallelujah, that peace can be yours. I shared it earlier, turn to Philippians 4. I want you to see it. Philippians 4. Verse number six and seven. 
This is a promise for every child of God. Listen to me, this is a promise for you today. I want you to get this into your spirit this morning and cling to this promise. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You're going through a trial, you're going through a test, Access has been provided through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Every day, take your prayers and petition to God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, The world's not going to understand it. They can't figure it out. Uh, But God has come to give us peace. Uh, It's been made possible through the blood of Jesus Christ. Peace even in the tough times. And it will guard your hearts. It will guard your minds through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So this morning, I need to ask you a couple of questions today. Has the wall of sin that separates you from God, has that been torn down in your life? Has the blood of Jesus Christ destroyed that wall? Do you have access to him? Have you said, God, I need you, save me, come and live inside of me? And the moment you humble yourself and pray a prayer like that, Jesus Christ comes in and he becomes your Lord and your Savior. And so I want to tell you, listen, man, woman, boy, or girl, tear down that wall. It's already been torn down by the blood. He just waits for you to come on over into that land of his grace. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you can invite him to come into your heart and life this morning. You just simply pray, God, I know I can't save myself. I know that I'm a sinner. I want you to come in and forgive me. I want you to take away my sins. I want you to live inside of me. And when you pray a simple prayer like that, Jesus Christ will come in and he will be your Lord and your Savior. Begin that new, exciting journey of walking with Jesus. And then my second appeal today, my second challenge today, maybe you're here this morning and you're anxious and you're restless and you don't have a peace in your heart. The storm is so great around you, your relationships are in shambles, you don't know how you're going to pay your bills this next week, Uh, your life seems to be crumbling in all around you, Uh, you can't sleep at night, you can't rest during the day and you are hurting right now, I want to tell you, you can run into the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shed his blood to give you his peace. Uh, Even in the midst of the storm, uh, you can run to him. His blood has made a way. And so he says, let everything by prayer and petition and supplication, I want to challenge this morning, take it again before the throne of grace. Uh, He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Uh, His blood has made a way. And you can say, God, help Help me, God, help me. And he'll give you strength. And you can leave with a peace in your heart. And listen, any cup that I'm drinking from now, Jesus Christ has already tasted it for me. He knows everything I feel. He's faced with every temptation I've ever had. And I can put my faith in him. And I can believe by faith Jesus Christ will bring me through.